All right, well, welcome to the uh, end of week three. Believe it or not, after today, we're a quarter of the way done with this quarter. Um, it's just flying right by, right? Um, so today's plan, we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit more. I'm gonna review a little bit the graphs of sine and cosine, just to make sure that we've got those down. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the graphs of the other four functions. Um, so tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. So by the end of today, we'll know what all the graphs of all those functions look like. And we'll also talk about all the different properties of the functions, right? Like uh, the things we did for sine and cosine, where we talked about like even and odd and period and um, domain and range and all that good stuff. Well, we'll do the same thing for the other trig functions, all right? But sine and cosine are the most important. If you're gonna know any one graph, know the graph of sine and cosine. Um, and you know, as I said, we called it a graph because I really do think of them as the same thing. Um, they're just shifted over a little bit, right? Okay, so um, that's my plan. But before I start running down that path, uh, are there any questions about the homework or anything else we've talked about in class? All right, so I'm not hearing anything and I'm not seeing anything. So I'm gonna go hop up to the whiteboard and I'll be right back with you. All right, so last time we um, spent some time drawing the graphs of sine and cosine and we saw that their graphs look pretty much the same, right? Um, they're both waves, they're what we call sinusoidal waves, and they oscillate, they bounce back and forth between plus and minus one as we move along and we get the nice little waveform. So let me just remind you the graphs of both of them real quick. Um, <clears throat> so if we start with the graph of sine of x, what it looks like, if we draw in some axes here, Important thing to remember for sine is that it goes through the origin and then it's going to go up and then come back down and continue this oscillation. All right, so just remember that it goes through the origin starting on its way up. Then it re reaches its peak, drops back down to a trough, up to a peak, trough, and so on. And so the coordinates. The x values, theta values, the angle values here, for these respective points are pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Every pi over 2, you get another one of the key points. Um, and it just goes from a 0 to a max to a 0 to a min, to a 0 to a max, to a 0 to a min, so on and so forth. All right. So that's what the graph of sine looks like. And then if we draw the graph of cosine, I'm going to draw it on the same axis here. I'm just going to change the color. So we'll, let, uh, we'll make it say orange. So for cosine, we're going to do exactly the same thing, except instead of going through the origin, start with a y-intercept at a maximum. And then it's going to do the same thing. It's going to drop down to 0, then go to a min. Then come back up to a zero, then go to a max, then come down to a zero, and so on. All right, but again, it gets its key points every pi over two. They're just different. They've just been slid by pi over two. And we saw why that was. It was from the cofactor, or sorry, the cofunction properties. So there's your graph of sine and cosine. So they're both waves. They just oscillate. All right, but then the other thing that we did uh, is we said, well, what if we apply transformations to these? What if we stretch them and compress them and all that? And so we went to a generic. What if we go to something like a cosine of bx minus c plus d, allowing for all the different kinds of transformations? And so just to remind you what all of them do, the a 
the absolute value of A is what we call the amplitude. And the amplitude is how far we go from the midline to our max or to our min. So on the graph, say, of this sine and cosine, that's our amplitude. All right. So for regular old sine and cosine, the amplitude is 1. So we have 1 times cosine of x. But we've seen that you can vary that. Right, and I think the example we did last time had an amplitude of two, but whatever. Um, if that A is bigger than one, it stretches it out vertically. If A is less than one, it compresses it. If it's negative, it flips it over. All right, so that's what A does. A gives us our amplitude. The B changes the period. The period ends up being two pi over the absolute value of B. So B is a horizontal stretch and compress, which is going to change the period. Remember what the period is, is how long it takes to repeat this function. So for regular sine and cosine, it's 2 pi, right? Like think about where this maximum is on cosine. It's at 0. The next maximum is at 2 pi. So we've got a period of 2 pi. And you actually see the same thing um, on sine. Um, like if you look at, say, the minima, this minimum is at minus pi over 2. This one's at 3 pi over 2, so it takes 2 pi or 3. Well, if you put in a B, it's going to change your period. It's going to either stretch it or compress it. If B is greater than 1, it's going to compress it. If B is less than 1, it's going to stretch it out. So it's opposite to what happens vertically, but it's still a stretch compress. Um, the C does what we call a phase shift. And it turns out you do have to divide by B because of order of operation. But your phase shift is C over B. And that just tells you how far left or right we're going to move this. And then the D is a vertical shift. So it's just going to shift it up or down. Just literally imagine taking this graph and moving it up or down. So that's what all those four pieces do. This is just transformation stuff. And like I mentioned last time, if you're still a little foggy on that, go back and look at stuff from um, the pre-calc sequence before this. So Math 103A is where we talked about it in our sequence. Um, or if you took it somewhere else, go back and look at your pre-calc. Look at your transformations because it will definitely help you draw these graphs. So just to kind of refresh your memory, let's put it all together and let's do another one just for practice before we get to the graphs of the other four. So um, suppose I ask you to draw the graph of y equals negative 4 sine of 1 half t plus pi over 3 minus 1. So if you look at this and you compare it, we have every one of them, every piece here. So let's get all the information and let's piece it together. OK, so we're going to start with the amplitude. The amplitude is going to be the absolute value of negative 4, which is 4. So this means from the midline, we're going to go up 4, and we're going to go down 4 to get our maxima and our minima, respectively. OK, the period is going to be 2 pi over the absolute value of 1 half. But since it's positive, we don't have to worry about the absolute value. 2 pi over 1 half is 4 pi. So now this is going to take 4 pi for it to repeat. Right? So if we've got a peak, we have to go 4 pi over until we run into the next peak. So we've stretched it out horizontally. All right. Um, and then the phase shift is going to be pi over 3 divided by 1 half, right? c over b. And if I flip that over and multiply, 
I get 2 pi over 3. Now, since this is a plus, we actually need to go the other direction. So it's going to be a 2 pi over 3 to the left. So like I said, I always write left or right, so I know which way it's going. Although in the book, you'll see uh, positive or negative phase shifts. But I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say left or right, because I think that makes a little bit uh, more sense and is more consistent. Then if you're reading cer certain books, they'll say a phase shift is positive for right, but positive for left in another book. And left and right, very clear. All right, so there's our uh, phase shift. And then our vertical shift is going to be down one. Sign it right here. Vertical shift is one, but we're going to go down because it's going to be subtracted. All right, so there's all the information. And now we're going to get to drawing the graph. All right, so here's what I recommend when you draw the graph in terms of the order of doing things. So first, let me just put some axes on here. And we'll put some tick marks so we've got some reference. A little bit further down. All right, and then we'll do the same thing horizontally. All right, so we'll see if we've got enough. If not, we'll extend it. All right, so um, in terms of the vertical scale, these are going to be ones. So this will be one, two, three, and so on. And then on the horizontal scale, I'm going to make mine pi over threes. So that means every three of them is a pi. So I'm just going to make it look like this. OK, so here's what I recommend you do. And, and this is what we did last time. So let me model it again. Start with the vertical shift. That vertical shift, we're going to go down one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a horizontal dashed line down one. Because what this is. This is the midline. So my wave is going to oscillate around this line. Okay. So I start there. Then after I have my midline, the next thing I'm going to put on is I'm going to go to the amplitude. So the amplitude is 4. So I'm going to go up four. One, two, three, four. I'm going to draw another dashed line. I'll make this one red. Because this is where my maxes are going to be. The maximum values are going to be here. So the top of my wave is going to hit this line. And then I'm going to go down four. Same thing as this line. And it does the same thing. It's just going to hold our mins. So my low points are going to be down there. All right. So now that I've got my central line, I also have my where my maxes and mins are. So again, if we're kind of playing along, keeping track, I took care of amplitude and vertical shift. So now the next thing I'm going to do is the phase shift. So I need to go 2 pi over 3 to the left. So since my tick marks are pi over 3s, 2 pi over 3 is going to be right here. So I need my graph to start there. 
Now, this is where I also have to pay attention to what function it is. And the function here is sine. So I know about sine. I know that it starts at the origin, right? When we're looking at the graph of regular sine, the point on the axis is the origin. So what this tells me is I'm going to need a point right here. So it's on the midline because that's where the origin was. But I have to come over here to pi over three. Okay. Or just think about the transformations. There was a shift of two pi over three left and one down. So a point that was here is going to move two pi over three to the left and one down. Okay, so we took care of the phase shift. Cool. Which then leaves just the period. So the period, again, this is how long it's going to be until I repeat, until I start drawing the same picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go from this point, 4 pi over. Well, I'm going to be on that same midline, but I'm going to be 4 pi to the right. So if you were to take minus 2 pi over 3 and add 4 pi, you're going to be over here at 10 pi. So if I draw the graph in between here, then I just have to copy it. That's the whole point of the period. It shows us the replication. All right, so now let's finish drawing the graph of sine. So we have to think about what are the important points. Well, we have the zeros. Halfway in between those is another zero. So there's be another point on the midline. And then halfway between the zeros are our maxes and our min. All right, so the question is, does it go up first or does it go down first? Now, if it's regular old sine, it goes up first. But if you come back and you look at our original function, it was a minus four. So it's negative. So that's a reflection. So instead of going up first, we're going to go down first. So that tells me I have to come down to a minimum. So the, the point that's halfway between these zeros is going to be a minimum for this graph. And then the point that's halfway in between these other zeros is going to be the maximum. Put it right there. So now that I have my key points, I can just connect the dots, try to do it so it looks like a sine wave. But that's what it looks like between minus 2 pi over 3 and 10 pi over 3. All right, well, then obviously what's going to happen is it's going to continue the process. So it's going to go down there and up and then and so on and forever. So it's kind of powerful, actually. If you know your transformations, you can get graphs of these waves super easily. And you don't need technology to do it, right? So when you're stuck on that um, deserted island with Tom Hanks and, and the volleyball, you're going to be able to get off it if all you got to do is draw a graph of minus 4 sine of 1 half t plus pi over 3 and minus 1. I, I'm waiting for that day when I can use my knowledge of graphs of sine and cosine to get myself out of a bad situation. I, I haven't run into it yet. But fingers crossed. Anyway, all right, so this is the process. Again, sine, cosine doesn't matter. The only difference is if it's cosine, instead of starting at the midline, we would have started with a peak. Unless it was negative, then we would have started with a trough. But you still kind of go through the same thing. So let me make my list here of my steps. You don't have to do it this way. You don't. But I find that this works the best. So if you think about what I did, what steps I did here to draw the graph of this thing. Um, first, I found all the information, right? So I'm going to put here, find amplitude, period, phase shift, vertical shift, right? I actually calculated those. Then I draw the midline. And I'm going to put in parentheses VS because it was the vertical shift that tells me that. 
then I draw the max and min lines. And the amplitude tells me that. Then I took care of the phase shift. And I am going to put in parentheses here, and I'm even going to change the color on it. Um, that when you do this, don't forget which function you have. So I'm put here, pay attention to the function. Because that's going to tell you whether or not you need to be on the midline, have a max or a min, whatever. So that depends on sine or cosine. And also the plus or minus sign in the front of it. Right? Right. So I did the phase shift. Then take care of the period. And then I guess the last step is key points, right? So I found my key points, the maxes and the mins and the zeros, and then connected the dots. So it's, it's a nice little recipe. Same thing every time. You just have to adjust these things depending upon what you found as you calculated your period amplitude phase shift and so on. All right, so there's just a little review of all those different things that we saw with sine and cosine. Now, the good news about moving on to the next functions, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, and the rest, or I guess that is the four of them, um, a lot of these things we don't have to worry about anymore because their graphs are different and they don't have the same properties. So we don't talk about things like amplitudes. Right? We do have periods still. We still can have phase shift, but it, it's a little bit less complicated when it comes to those. It's just their graphs are not as nice. All right, so let's actually find them. Let's see what the graphs of the other four trig functions look like, and then we'll talk about their properties, things like domain and range and all that as well. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with tangent. Just like we did before, we're going to do a T chart. Well, we're going to use the values from our trig chart to draw a graph of tangent. Okay? So let's look at the graph of y equals tangent of theta. All right, well, we'll put on some axes like we always do. And let's plot ourselves some points. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and do some tick marks here. All right, so um, just to help us out a little bit, um, let's make this third one pi over two. And then that makes this one pi. That's my pi over two. And then vertically, um, let's go ahead and just do these as halves. So one half, one, Two and so on. So every two of them is uh, a one. All right. So let's just start plotting the values that we calculate with tangent. So let's go down that tangent column on our chart. So our chart that we built. At zero, we got a tangent of zero. Cool. Nice and easy. So then at pi over six, if you look at the chart for pi over six, we get the square root of three divided by three. And I want to say the decimal approximation of that is around 0.588. So it's a little bit more than uh, 0.5, so it's like 0.588. So let's make it a little bit higher than a half. But this right here is pi over six. The way I've got my tick mark. Okay, then pi over four, which is the halfway between these tick marks, a tangent is equal to one. That's a nice easy number. 
And then when we get to pi over three, we get the square root of seven, or sorry, square root of seven, square root of three. So pi over three, you get the square root of three, which is like 1.7 something. Here. And then when we get to pi over two, we see that it's undefined. Okay, so that means there is no graph at pi over two. But if we think about it, we go, all right, well, what happens as we get close to pi over two? Think back to the definition of tangent on the unit circle. Okay, so here's a unit circle. Let's think about how tangent is defined. The tangent is the y divided by the x. So think about as we're getting closer to pi over 2. That means we're rotating this direction. We're getting close to vertical. Think about what's happening to these numbers. The y's are getting closer and closer to 1. But the x's are getting closer and closer to 0. They're getting really, really small. So what happens when you divide by something really small? What happens to your number? It gets bigger. Yeah, it gets way bigger, right? Think about like dividing by, you know, point zero 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 one. That's like multiplying by a million. You know, the whole step and multiply. So this number is going to get incredibly large which means on this graph, it's just going to grow forever. So what we actually see at pi over 2 is a vertical asymptote. And so this is what tangent's going to look like between 0 and pi over 2. All right. so. Now, let's move to the next ones and do the same thing. Well, if we keep going down our chart after pi over 2, we get 2 pi over 3, which is right here. And we get a value of negative square root of 3. So that's somewhere like right about there. At uh, 3 pi over 4, we get negative 1. At 5 pi over 6, we get negative root 3 over 3. Seven. And then at pi, we get zero. And so what we see is exactly the same thing. It's just we're going down to negative instead of zero. All right, well, then keep going down your chart. After pi, we start seeing the positive values again. And at 3 pi over 2, we get an asymptote. After that, we get the negative values again. And then we just repeat. So what you're going to see with tangent, the graph of tangent, is just a whole bunch of these shapes. I don't even know what to call those shapes. But we just see this picture copied again and again and again and again and again. So that's what the graph of tangent looks like. So notice this doesn't exactly have the idea of amplitude anymore. Amplitude for the, the sinusoidal waves was sort of a max and min. How far can we go? Well, now tangents, they can go forever. They, go, they grow infinitely large and they drop infinitely small. So it doesn't make sense to say that. All right, so amplitude doesn't make sense. Period. Does period make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It just repeats itself. So we see repetition. That means it's periodic, which means there's going to be a period. All right. So we don't really talk about amplitude of these things, but we do talk about period. All right. So let's start making a list of the properties of tangent in terms of the kind of important things for functions. All right. And so I'm going to start here with the domain. So the domain is not everything. There are angles where the tangent doesn't exist. And in fact, you see some on your chart, right? If you look at your chart, you see that pi over 2, tangent's undefined. 3 pi over 2, tangent's undefined. So 
There are places where it's undefined, which means the domain does have issues. And on the graph, those issues are where the vertical asymptotes happen. And notice that those happen at all the odd half pies. So what I'm going to write here, the domain is all thetas that are not equal to, so I'm just going to list the problem box. And um, I'm going to write that as n plus, uh, I'm going to write this odd half pies. I'll write it in words. It's better than trying to draw it in terms of uh, symbols. Okay, so we have a problem at all the odd half pies. So one pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, and so on. All right, other than that, we're totally good. We get tangent values. It's just we can't be where um, theta is one of the odd half pies. Now, if you go back and you look at sine and cosine, those were the places where cosine was zero. And that's not coincidence. Because remember, tangent, we're dividing by x, and x is the cosine value. And so if we divide by zero, that's wrong. All right, so that's its domain. In terms of its range, the values that come out of this go from minus infinity to infinity. This graph goes forever down in lots of places. It goes forever up in lots of places. So we actually get everything out of tangent. There is an angle whose tangent is a million. It's close to pi over two, but it exists. I mean, there's an angle whose tangent is a Google. And I don't know if you know this, a, a Google not spelled like the Google search engine, but um, there's a number Google, which is 10 to the hundredth. So one with a hundred zeros after it. There's an angle whose tangent is that. It's really close to pi over two. But tangent will grow forever. Okay, so there's its domain, there's its range. Um, other things, the y intercept, it is the origin, it goes through the origin, just like sine did. In terms of x intercepts, they're at all of the whole number of pi. Zero, pi, I erased it, but there was one at two pi. You'll see another one at three pi, four pi, five pi, also going the other direction. So its intercepts are exactly the same as sines. Cool, I guess. All right, so there are our intercepts. Okay, um, how about this? What about the period? Because it definitely repeats. But what's the period of this thing? What do you guys think? Shout it out, type it in the chat box. What's the period of tangent? Is it is it because it repeats at um, the odd pi over two? Okay, so it definitely repeats at the odd pi over two. So what are you thinking, Danielle? What do, what do you think then is the period? What's the number for the period? Pi over two. Okay, so pi over two. What do the rest of you guys think? Danielle, right? That would be my guess too. Okay, cool. You got some backup there. You got to like that. I'm not alone. Okay, so let's think about what period means. Again, remember, period is the shortest distance that we go until we start repeating again. Now, I love the fact that you're seeing that it's not two pi, right? Unlike sine and cosine, this repeats faster. Right? But let's think about pi over two. So that means if I start at any point and I go pi over two over, I'm at exactly the same, in this case, y value. 
All right, so let's say I'm right here at the origin. If I go pi over two to the right, Am I on an intercept again? No. I'm at an asymptote. So how about going from this intercept, how far do I have to go until I hit another intercept? Pi. I gotta go pi. All right, well, let's think about if we're at an asymptote. How far do we have to go until we run into the next asymptote? So like, let's start here and move over. That's again, a distance of pi. I know you're seeing the pi over twos, but think of it, it's, it's a half pi plus another half pi. And two halves makes a whole, a whole pi. So it turns out that the period for tangent is pi. So it repeats twice as fast as sine and cosine. In fact, take a look at your your chart there for tangent, if you've got it handy. And look at the values from zero to pi. And then look at the values from pi to two pi. And you'll see that they are an exact duplicate. Like exact duplicate, identical. Because the period is only pi. So tangent goes a little bit faster than sine and cosine. Uh, so if period is pi. All right, well, there you go. There's the graph of tangent. So not nearly as nice um, and definitely not as useful in the real world. In the real world, like I was talking about last time, there are lots of places where you see waves. There are not a lot of places where you see shapes like this out in the real world. Okay. Um, so, but there it is. There's the graph of tangent. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's just move to the next guy. What about cotangent? Well, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to take the values from our chart. We're going to draw some dots, connect them, do all that good stuff. But we'll do this a little bit faster. Um, first of all, I'm sure it's not going to surprise you that the shape looks very similar tangents. That should make sense. If sine and cosine's graphs look very similar, then tangent and cotangent's graphs should look similar, right? And um, so we're going to see a very similar shape. I, this it just reminded me of something I forgot to put on this list. I want to put this on here for cotangent or for tangent. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that it's also an odd function. I know I subsequently erased it, but think about what odd means. Odd means the symmetry is that rotational symmetry. If you take that graph of tangent and rotate it half a rotation, you see exactly the same shape. Okay, so it's odd just like sine was odd. All right, well, let's draw the graph of cotangent. And again, we're gonna take key points. So um, if we start and we look at our chart, we'll see that at zero, this function is undefined. So that means that it's going to have an asymptote at zero. It also has an asymptote at pi. Right? So somewhere out here is pi. There's going to be an asymptote because it's undefined. And then again, somewhere out here is 2 pi. There's another asymptote. OK, so just like with tangent, cotangent has asymptotes that repeat every pi. All right, well, then if we go and we take our y values and put them in here, at pi over 2, we get 0. And then we get the other values, um, the square root of 3, 1, root 3 over 3. And so what we're going to see is that shape. As we go towards pi, those things turn negative. We'll see this shape. After pi, they're positive again. Then they go negative. 
And so here's your graph of cotangents. So if you compare that to tangent, it looks very similar. It still has that same shape, but there are a couple of differences. The first, the first big difference is that it's shifted. The asymptotes are now at the pi's instead of pi over twos. What, we're shifting half a pi for a co-function? Who knew? Right, uh, yeah, okay. Same thing happened with sine and cosine. But there's another really big difference. What's the other big difference between this and the one that we just drew of tangent? Um, the domain is different. Okay, so the domain is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be that because of that shifting over again. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the range is different, but the range is the same, right? Because, but it's just backwards. Range is still the same. Yeah. Yeah. See that again, though. What about backwards? Well, I mean, um, you know, the arrows are just backwards. Okay. They're like it's like yeah. That's where I'm going with the huge fundamental difference. These things go down, right? As we move to the right, we go down on these shapes. For tangent, we went up. So that that's actually a pretty big difference. I, I love how Daniel's like, oh, it's just the arrows are going the other way. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, but for functions, that's huge. That's a huge, huge difference. So they are the same shape. They're just oriented the other way, right? So, um, but yeah, let, let's make our list now for cotangent in terms of domain and range and all that good stuff. Okay, so now we've got our domain. So this is our cotangent of theta. Okay, so the domain. Now, the thetas cannot be n pi. You can't put in whole pies. Well, that's because of that shift, the co-function shift. We'll call that, for, that's what we're going to call it from now on. It's the co-function shift. So the co-function shift makes this happen. The range, it's identical. It still will get as big as we want, and it will get as small as we want. It's just a different place. All right, um, in terms of the y-intercept, this time there isn't one. We don't actually cross the y-axis because the function is not defined. Right? So there's no y-intercept. The x-intercepts, well, these are now at the odd half pi's. So that change, again, if you look at the x-intercepts for tangent versus cotangent, again, due to the co-function shift. We're, just out of, we're, we're shifted over pi over two. All right, the period. What about the period of this thing? How far do we have to go till we start repeating with cotangent? Pi. Yeah, it's the same as before. It's still pi. I think it's actually a little bit easier to see on the graph of cotan, right? Because you look at, okay, from asymptote to asymptote, you go from zero to pi, zero to pi. Okay, so they share the same period, which again, should, that, that makes sense. And then what about this? Is this odd or even, the graph of this function? Because it's one of them. Which symmetry does it have? Does it have the fold over symmetry or the rotational symmetry? It's, is it an even? Okay, so even would mean this axis looks like a mirror, would play like a mirror. Okay, so odd. Yeah, so, yeah, so odd. So it's not even because even would mean we'd have to see like a tangent shape on this side, which we don't have. This is odd because if you were to rotate it, I, this is something I can't do with my whiteboard, but if you draw this on a piece of paper, take your paper, 
and literally do this. And you'll see that it looks identical. Here, I'll do it for you. Okay, so here's your graph. Yeah, same, same. Okay. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna turn it over. Same graph, same thing, right? So if you can do that, that's an even function. All right, so, all right, sorry, an odd function. So this guy's odd as well. So it's kind of cool so far, every single trig function has been either even or odd, right? Sine was odd. Cosine was even, tangent was odd, cotangent was odd. So it's probably not going to be surprising that secant and cosecant are also even or odd. All right, well, there you go. So there's the graph of cotangent. Again, looks a lot like tangent. It's just been shifted over. Got the cofactor shift, or sorry, cofunction shift. And then uh, it actually goes the opposite direction. All right, so there you go. There are tangent and cotangent, which then, of course, leaves secant and cosecant. So let's take a look at those guys. So we'll go ahead and start with secant, just because it's the next one on our chart. Um, but we're going to do exactly the same thing. Like if you're getting bored with this, you probably should be. Because it's the same thing every time. Plot the points, connect the dots. All right, well, let's see what happens with secant. All right, so again, I'll, I'll try to do this in a relatively decent way, at least for the first one. All right, so uh, again, for our tick marks here, let's make every one of them vertically a half. So we'll go one, two, three, like that. So minus one, minus two, and so on. And then horizontally, um, let's do pi. Um, yeah, we'll do three of them for pi again. So every three horizontally is going to be a pi. All right, so let's start with cotangent, or sorry, um, secant. And let's just go down the list. So at zero, secant has a value of one. So that means that we're going to get a dot right here. All right, pi over six, which is, uh, let's see, if that's pi over three, then pi over six is halfway here. At pi over six, we get a value of, for this one, uh, two root three over three. Okay, I don't remember what that number is. Let's see, root three over three was around 0.8, so double is around 1.6 something. It's like 1.6 something. So that's like right here. At pi over four, we get root two. Uh, that can't be 1.6. Because root two is 1.4. Hold on, root two is 1.4. And then at pi over three, we get two. Okay, so there are our points. And then when we run to pi over two, we run into that undefined business again, which means there's going to be an asymptote at pi over two. 
But if we connect the dots, we're going to see something that looks like that. Forgive me my two root three over three. I, I don't know that one off the top of my head. Oh, because it's 0.588 double. It's slightly under 1.2. Wrong number. Anyway, and these are the points. It, it's frightening. I, I know these decimals so well because I just run into them all the time in trade. Don't be like, oh my God, he knows how to calculate the square root of three in his head. I don't. I don't. I just have seen it enough that I kind of remember it. All right. So here's the graph between zero and pi over two. All right. Well, let's put in kind of the other key points. Before we get into the in the quadrants, let's do the quadrantals. At pi, we get a or a secant of negative one. At three pi over two, we get another undefined vertical asymptote. At two pi, we get another one. And then if you go and you plot the values, you're gonna see from my, uh, pi over two to three pi over two, they're all negative, I get this value. And then from three pi over to two pi, they're positive again, which is something like this. All right, now once we get to two pi, we just repeat. We come back over here and we're going to start heading towards another vertical asymptote. And it's going to go up. And then it's going to go down. And then it's going to go up. And then it's going to go down and so on and so forth. So let me go ahead and finish this over here. Get us a little bit in the negative direction. So this is a graph of secant. I find this much more interesting than the graph of tangents. Um, and it's, I mean, it, it rivals sine and cosine, um, but it's not a wave. It's just a series of alternating smiles and frowns. That's Don't those I, smiles and crowns just go at the maxes and mins of cosine? Dude, spoiler alert. Oh, my bad. No, they do. So check it out. So it's just alternating smiles and frowns, right? So smile, frown, smile, frown, smile, frown. All right. So um, I, I don't know who that was that just chimed in. But, you know, uh, uh, but yeah, check this out. Think about secant and think about its buddy function from the big three. Right? Which of the big three is secant the reciprocal of? Sign. It's a good guess, but not quite right. It's cosine. Whatever COS is. So secant is the reciprocal of cosine. And don't, don't feel bad about getting that one wrong. It takes a while till you get, you get them down. But check this out. Let's draw the graph of cosine on here. Remember how cosine goes? It's, it's a wave. Starts with a max at the axis. Well, if you draw the graph of cosine, it is exactly that these smiles and frowns meet at the maxes and mins of cosine. And the asymptotes all happen at the zeros of cosine. So that is actually kind of cool. And makes it so that it's really easy to remember the graph of secant. If you know the graph of cosine, okay, well, every zero put an asymptote at the maxes, have your smiles and have your mins. That's where your frowns are going to be. All right, so there you go. There's the graph of secant, alternating smiles and frowns. So let's make our list like we've done with the other functions in terms of the properties of this thing. So this will be for secant of theta. So let's start with the domain. So this one, there are restrictions, right? There are places where the graph doesn't exist. There are vertical asymptotes.
and it's everywhere but the odd half pies, everywhere but the odd pi over two. Exactly the same as tangents. So. so secant and tangent share the same domain because from the unit circle, they were both formed by dividing by x, right? And so um, when we have division by zero with tangent, we have it with secant. All right, now the range is kind of trippy because it's got two pieces. There are the values that we get from the smiles and the values that we get from the frowns. The smiles, we get numbers from one up as big as we want. So that's the one to infinity over here. It gets a bracket on the one because we do get one. There are angles that give us a secant of one. And then the frowns, same idea. It's everything from minus infinity up to minus one. So that's this guy. Again, we do get negative one. And then we put the union symbol, just a big U in between. Um, saying that we're sticking those two together. Those are the two pieces for this range. Okay, but look at this range and compare it to like sine and cosine. Uh, notice that like if you are to take this and the range of cosine, you get everything. Right, cosine fits in the gap formed by secant. Or alternatively, you can think of it as secant fills the bit that's not covered by cosine. Okay, so there are the domain and range. Um, in terms of intercepts, y-intercept, again, is 0, 1. It's the same y-intercept as cosine. But x-intercepts, there actually aren't any. It never actually crosses the x-axis. Now, don't look at the black. Right, the black here was cosine. It's the orange that's secant, and the orange never crosses the x-axis. So there are no x-intercepts. Uh, it does have a period. It does repeat. So how far do we have to go till we start repeating with this one? Best way to think about it? Pi. All right, so you get a vote for pi. Think about this, think about like the bottom of a smile. Is it two pi? How far do we have to get another bottom of the smile? And then it, it's gonna be two pi. By the time we go pi, well now we're down on the frown. So it doesn't look exactly the same after pi. So pi is in the period but it does look exactly the same after two pi. If you started say the top of a frown, the next top of a frown is in two pi. So this one, its period is just like sine and cosine. It's also two pi. All right, so last question, is it even? Or is it odd? Do we have folding symmetry or do we have rotating symmetry? Odd. I'm going to say odd. All right. I think we've got a couple of votes for odd. I feel like it's even. I'm, I'm going to go even because it's the reciprocal of cosine. Okay. So then we get a couple of both for even. Oh, I love it. We're going to have a big fight here. Okay, so it's reciprocal of cosine. We already know cosine is even. So think about, again, what even means. If you were to think of this vertical axis as a mirror, do you see the mirror image on opposite sides? And we totally do. Like, think about this little piece of the smile its image in the mirror would be the other piece of the smile. 
this frown in the mirror is going to look like another frown that's a little bit further away. That's this. So it ends up being even because cosine is even. So I get that. Sorry, Bruce, but if you flip it upside down, isn't it the same too? And that was what you said. I get why you're saying this is an even function, but. So the other is if I rotate it, so it's, it's not a flip down, but I rotate it. Okay, well, let, let's do the same thing. Uh, let me grab another pad here. And I'm going to do the same thing where I um, take this and I just do the rotation. You rotate it, the smiles turn to frowns, the frowns turn to smiles, right? Yeah, that's what we're going to see happens. So I'm putting on axes as well, since we're going to need to see those. Um, but let me real quick smile, frown, smile. Frown. Okay, so. Does that look good for um, secant? Right, we got our smile right here on the axis and then alternating smile frowns. So let me rotate it. Does that look the same? And the answer should be no, because now instead of having a smile on the axis, we've got a frown on the axis. Okay. So this is not odd. Odd would have meant as soon as I do this, I see exactly the same thing, but I don't. So smiles became frowns, frowns became smiles. It's not odd. All right, and even, uh, this, you know what? This actually kind of works to show that even. Let me fold it in half right on the axis. See how the frowns down here are going to match up. And then the other smiles that are up there end up matching up. That's got that reflective symmetry, the foldable symmetry, which makes it even. It does turn out that there are some functions that are both even and odd. It is possible to have both kinds of symmetry, but this is not one of them. All right, so does that make a little more sense? I hope that the visual helps you see a little bit better the, the even and oddness. Um, but that, that's what I do to think about it. Uh, again, because I'm kind of visual and I can, in my mind, I can manipulate things. Like you may have seen those, like the questions on the standardized tests that we took back in you know, school. Uh, where it was like, which of these shapes is different from the others? And they're all rotated in weird ways. I never had a problem with this because I can, just, like, my brain just, yeah, I, I can picture that. So um, I literally, in my mind, see this rotating and I go, oh man, nope, now that smile's a frown. It's not, it's not odd. Anyway. All right, so there's the graph of secant. And there are the properties of it. Just because, because of how it's defined. All right, well, that leaves cosecant, but we can do this one kind of fast now that we've seen the tricks. Specifically, we're going to take sine and use the fact that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. All right, so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to start by drawing sine. So sine starts at the origin. And then we get our way. I'm going to start by putting in asymptotes at the zeros. Then I'm going to put my smiles and frowns so that they're touching the peaks and troughs of the sign.
All right, and now I'm going to erase the sign just because I don't want it so cluttered. But there, my friends, is the graph of cosecant. So again, it looks a lot like secant. It smiles and frowns. But what's different about it? The cofunction shift. Right? The asymptotes now are at the whole pies instead of the half pies. This smile, instead of being on the axis, has been shifted over by pi over two. The cofunction shift, just like all the other. All right, so if we make our list then for cosecant in terms of all the different properties, it's this fast. Okay, so in terms of the domain, we can't be at the whole pies now. So like if you look at your chart and you go down the cosecant line column, you're going to see that it's undefined at all of the whole pies at zero, pi, two pi, and so on. The range, yeah, identical to secant. Because all we did was shift it over. We don't have the same range. Um, this time, there are no intercepts at all, x or y. Again, no x-intercepts. You see it clearly goes across the x-axis. But now, because of the co-function shift, there's no y-intercept either. OK. Uh, period, well, the period is still 2 pi. By the time, like if you're at a bottom, by the time you get to the next bottom, you go two pi. But then this one's not even, it doesn't have the symmetry like before of folding, but it does have the rotational symmetry. Think about this smile. If I rotate it over here, it becomes this frown. That frown, when I rotate it, becomes the smile. And you can do the same thing that I did with a piece of paper, and, and you can easily see that this thing is odd. All right, so there you go. There are the graphs of the other four. So tangent and cotangent. Yeah, they got those weird. Uh, they are my least favorite of the six. Um, I definitely like secant and cosecant. I like these alternating smiles and frowns, and I especially like how they fit in with their reciprocal function. Um, but regardless of whether I like them or not, this is what they are. Right? This is what these functions look like. So we can add those now to our library of functions. Like think about all the other functions whose graphs you know. You know parabolas. You know the exponential functions. You know uh, that you know, huge list. Well, here are some more now that we can add. OK, I think we're out of time for today. And even if we're not, I, I think this is a good place to stop. Um, so the only thing I haven't talked about in terms of these is what happens when we throw in the A, B, Cs, and Ds. And so we'll address that on Monday. Um, that's the last little bit from this that we have to take care of on Monday. And then uh, I'm going to introduce you to um, the inverses of these functions. All right. So just some other things, just housekeeping to remind you. Um, obviously, the exam, we moved it from today. It's next Wednesday. And just so you know, because I'm sure some of you want to go ahead and start studying for it, it's going to cover Chapter 7 and Sections 8.1 and 8.2, which are the graphs of all this stuff. So we, we've pretty much covered all of that, which is the, the slight little difference, or a slight little bit that we haven't dealt with. So. Um, let me go ahead and write that down, though, just as a reminder. So exam next Wednesday on 7, 1 through 7, 4, and 8, 1, and 8, 2.
Okay, so don't forget about that. You can go ahead and start studying for that, get ready. Um, and then um, also don't forget that the next homework sets are due Monday night at midnight. So make sure you get in there and play with those. All right. So other than that, I'm going to wish you guys a very wonderful weekend. Um, it looks like we're going to have some awesome weather up here in Tahoe. So get out, get a hike in, do something outside. And uh, I will see you all on Monday. All right. Adios. Thank you very much. Hey, Bruce, I had a question for you. Sure. Give me one second here.